How's it going, everybody? Thanks for hopping on the webinar tonight. We're going to give, obviously, a little bit of time for people to roll in. I can see people rolling in steadily, but uh, we're going to have a good time this evening. We're going to talk about spring turkey hunting, uh, more importantly, how to use the Hunt app in spring turkey hunting situations. Um, it, today is March the 21st. I'm currently down in central Mississippi. Our general season's been open since March the 15th. Um, and so now would be a good time to exercise the use of the Q&A or the chat box because your, your cameras are off and you're muted, so we can't see you or hear you. So if you want to have any input within this webinar, use the chat box. If you have any questions, use the Q&A. This is going to be laid back. I mean, obviously, I have a little bit of a presentation that Jack and I are going to work through, but um, we're going to try is, is try to get through as many of these questions um, that were sent in previously. And then obviously I'm sure you're going to, you're going to send some in um, while we're doing it live. But again, use that chat box, use the Q and a box. We're also going to be doing a giveaway. We've got some pretty cool um, Turkey on X t-shirts. The link to that is going to be posted in the Q and a box. Is that right, Jack? It's Q and a uh, box. In the chat box. Turkey. In the chat box. I was close. I was close. Um, but yeah, we'll do that right there at the end um and oh also so obviously what we're going to be talking about tonight is going to be very much app centric like how we're using the hunt app the functionality of the hunt app if some of this stuff goes over your head if there's some more like actual like how do i use this feature that and you you feel like you're missing something here don't fret um we have some very good resources for you that that you could use to to better yourself and to get more familiar with the Hunt app, the first of those is there is a App 101, which is going to be another live webinar just like this. Um, Jack runs that and always does an excellent job with it. And then April 5th, is that right? April 5th. And right now I'm going to drop a link in the chat so that people can go to our masterclass landing page. That's where the sign up link is located. So it keeps getting lost because so many people are chiming in, which is good. I'll post that a couple of times. So if you're looking for that 101, kind of the nuts and bolts, basic how to use Onyx, click that link and you can sign up for the 101 on April 5th. Yeah. Yep. And another thing, those app, those app 101s are are great, especially if you're if you're a new user of Onyx or if there's a, a feature. I've seen this happen a bunch of times. If you're hunting with a buddy and you see your buddy doing something with the app that you had no idea you could do. Um, that kind of thing happens all the time. So those app 101s are great. If you want to familiarize yourself with the Hunt app and make sure that you're maximizing its potential, check one of those out. Another thing that we're doing is uh, the Onyx Hunt YouTube channel. We are uploading every week, we're uploading sort of some Onyx resource videos that we're showing very, um, like very case specific um, instances of how to use the Hunt app for certain turkey hunting situations. Like I said, we're updating those weekly. So go to the Onyx YouTube channel and check that out. Also, if we cover something in this particular webinar that you miss and you're like, man, I wish I could hear that again. Don't fret about that either, because this will be uploaded to the Onyx YouTube tomorrow. So um, with that said, it is 6.03. I think we can go ahead and get this thing going. So yeah. I'm going to share my screen. Jack, how are we doing there? Can you see my screen? Sure can. Cool. All right. So I'm going to start out again. Obviously, this is all going to be kind of centered around spring turkey hunting. Obviously, tis the season. Uh, I'm going to start out with some basic things and then kind of go more in depth from there. Uh, just things that I think like just on a ground level that if you're going to use this app to spring turkey hunt, you absolutely need these functions. And so the first thing that I'm going to talk about is base maps. And obviously I'm using the web map right now currently, um, but this all applies to using it on your phone as well, um, which is, you know, a lot more obviously where you're going to be using the app more often. So um, right down here, you'll see this little icon here. I'll click on it, and that's going to bring up my base map tab. Right now, I'm on satellite, but there's also a hybrid mode and a topographic mode. Um, going back to, to strictly turkey-related instances, one of the biggest mistakes that I see people do right off the bat is they'll be running their app on a strictly satellite map all the time while they're turkey hunting. 
The reason why I say that is a mistake is like this particular property that I've dropped the waypoint that I've dropped a waypoint on. We're just looking at the satellite imagery. I mean, just take a look at this map. I mean, we can see there's some timber. We can see there's some openings that looks like a like a creek system. Maybe I think that's a food plot down around right there. But I, it may look like I'm getting a lot of information. But let's see what happened when we turn on the hybrid maps. And then all of a sudden, we realize there's a lot more information to be had on that map. Like and and where I'm at right now, I'm I'm in the hills. This particular property is in the hills along the Mississippi Delta. Um, some of the more like topo laden areas within the entire state of Mississippi. So if you're more of a flatlander like I am, and you're used to most things being flat, and you don't use topo maps, you'd roll up into this area thinking everything was flat and and not really knowing how to navigate around, and you, you could end up being very confused. <laughs> so. Topo is a is a huge a huge ben, uh, benefactor when using the app during spring turkey season for a whole lot of reasons. One of the biggest ones is, as you can see, if I just toggle this thing off and on again, when I turn the hybrid map on, not only do I get do I get my topo lines, but I get my creek systems and my drainage systems. Um, drainage systems and creek systems are a a keystone uh, when it comes to turkey habitat, where turkeys like to hang out, where they like to spend their time, where they like to roost. A lot of those things are tied back to drainages and creek systems. And so I, the only time I ever really are just using satellite imagery is if I, if I can't really see something clear enough, I may toggle it off for a little while. But for the most part, I would say if you're going into spring turkey season, have your hybrid maps on. I just think you're missing too much um, information if you don't. There's just so much information to be had there. So, and then to move forward in diving into to topo lines just a little bit more, because um, I realized there are some folks that, you know, for the longest time, I didn't know how to read topographic lines, and I was a little bit intimidated by it. Um, and I heard all these turkey hunters that I looked up to saying like, hey, you need to learn how to read topo. It will help you tremendously within the turkey woods. And so I'm going to give like a super quick crash course on topographic lines and what you can kind of do is start piecing that together to make it work for you where you're hunting. And so topo is basically the the closer your lines are together, the steeper the terrain is where you're at. So again, like I said, we're this property is right on, on the hills in the Mississippi Delta. And so when it drops off into the Delta, it's flat as a pancake. And you can kind of tell that because we got all these bunch of lines right here just stacked together. And then as soon as it gets to the bottom, those topo lines get way more stretched out. And so for your general rule of thumb, if you're just learning how to read topo, imagine you're looking at a staircase. So like if you're looking at a like a very gradual staircase, like gently sloping up, sometimes those stairs are more widely gapped apart. However, if you're going up a steep staircase, they're generally more stacked together. And so we can see as it starts sloping down more generally, those lines get further and further apart. And then when it gets in that really steep stuff, it starts stacking them in closer together. Another thing to look at is knobs and, and high points. The reason why that's significant is when you find knobs and hob, hi, uh, excuse me, knobs and high points, that plays in in a couple of different ways. One, a knob or a high point is somewhere that I generally want to be when I'm listening for a turkey, whether I'm breaking day right there, trying to hear a turkey on the roost, or sometimes a turkey likes to roost on a knob or off the edge of a knob. So I need to know what those are. So we talked about lines stacked together like that, that steep, when I can see a full circle somewhat, or kind of a circle like, like this right here, that would be a knob. Um, that right there, that's a knob. And that leads me to another thing, you know, a lot of a, a topographic term you hear pop up a lot is a saddle. And so a saddle is where you have two knobs close to each other. And then the gap in between that, that would be a saddle. But again, topo is translating that over into how it works for you in turkey hunting is, um, for instance, I've hunted on this ground before, and we would always find turkeys roosted along this along this drainage very often. And again, if I 
so so many times we would hear a turkey goblin like off in here and then learning how to use that read that topo I can use that knowledge to know that like hey the best thing for me to do is if this turkey's goblin right here and I'm standing over here the best move is not for me to just go straight towards him rather than maybe dump off into this bottom here work my way around and then try to get up even with him but topo is is absolutely huge um and that's one of the things that again like basics i would want like everyone to learn from from the get-go if you're going to use this app for turkey hunting uh you need to learn how to read topo the second thing moving on from that um and if anyone has any jack did i leave anything off there i know i was talking kind of fast sounded pretty good to me gotcha if there's if you have any questions about that specific we can touch on that later um Another thing is is offline maps, and that's something that that we get a lot of questions about. Um, so offline maps can can help you tremendously because you wherever you are, you want to be able to have you want to be able to have full functionality of your app. And so whether you're traveling to somewhere that you've never been before, or you're going to a specific place that you know doesn't have cell service. Uh, you need to download offline maps. And it is a super easy process. You can download them straight to your phone or you can do it like I'm about to show you how to do it. And that would be right here on the web map. You see this little tab that says offline maps in the top left. I would simply click that and I'll click the plus sign down here that says new offline map. And then it's going to start giving me some options. For one, I can I can move this around. You know, I can kind of make sure that the kind of the core of where I'll be is going to definitely be within that map. And then we have different, different options as far as low, medium, and high resolution um, and, and save those. And the thing, when you save them on your web map, the next time you get on your phone, you'll be able to download it to your phone as well. It, it transfers over. Um, but that is also falls very much within common mistakes that I see people do like and and to be honest for the longest time I was bad about doing it like I would find myself hunting a national forest and I would get down in there and I would have no service and I'd end up kicking myself because I would be like I knew good and well that there's no service down here and I've been sitting you know at my house or at an office with wi-fi the entire day before and had all the time in the world to download these offline maps and I just didn't do it and it doesn't take long like it, it, it's it's a very quick process but um uh, yeah i mean offline maps is is huge i would i would even go as far as if there's areas that you frequently hunt a lot and you know that you're going to you're going to hit those areas up fairly regularly then just go ahead and download offline maps for them unless you just have all star service and all of them um translating out of that well let's go let me see we've done topo lines we've done offline maps Let's go to turkey habitat. So one of the things that is absolutely key for, for turkey hunting is finding turkeys, right? I mean, like everyone, the, the thing that everyone like dreams about is sitting, sitting down to a tree and yelping to one and him gobbling and him coming in. But to get to that point, you have to effectively find a turkey first. And that can be one of the more difficult things to do. And luckily this app that we have, you can, there are ways that you can key in on areas where you're more likely to find a turkey. So I know I just zoomed into this, but let's cut that off for a second. One thing that um, I see, again, I, I, I lean on like mistakes that I've made, mistakes that I see people make all the time is they'll go like, whatever this piece of public ground is, they'll be like, all right, Here's a piece of public right here. This is uh, this piece here is eleven thousand acres. Surely there's a turkey on there somewhere, and they drop a waypoint and they drive to that that giant piece of public, and then they just kind of blindly ride roads or walk off into bottoms and hope that they find a turkey. And don't get me wrong, sometimes that works. Like you definitely can can make that happen. Like sometimes you stop your car or your truck in the right spot and you know, hoot like an owl or yelp and he gobbles and it's off to the races. And that's great. What what I would like to offer to you is that there are ways that you can really narrow that search down. So you're not just like opening up your hunt with 11,000 acres that you've got to pick through. You can kind of like hone in certain certain pockets within that 
that you're more likely to find a turkey. And so one of the best ways that I've learned to do that is through tree species layers. Um, and I'm going to go to the layer first, and then I'll explain why that's important. So up at the top, there's this tab that says hunt map layers um, on your phone. It's going to be down at the bottom, but the, the tab essentially looks the same. It's just this little rectangle hunt map layers. We'll click that and we'll scroll down until we see this trees, crops, and cover layer. I'm gonna click on that. And then we have a couple different options there. The ones that I focus on for, for doing what I'm talking about are uh, focused on tree species. And so I look at acorn producing oaks. Uh, we can look at the details there that's gonna show us white oaks, red oaks, mixed oaks. Um, I look at uh, deciduous versus coniferous trees. Deciduous, um, disclaimer there, the deciduous versus coniferous is um, insanely useful down here in the Southeast where I'm from. And let me turn one of these on so it, so it kind of makes sense. It looks a little daunting right there, but when you start, like if I'm talking about uh, this particular piece of property, when I start to zoom in, I can start pulling more use out of it. The reason why deciduous trees versus coniferous trees is important to me is um, turkeys need certain things habitat wise to be able to survive, to be able to live comfortably. They need habitat diversity. They need water. They need roost trees. They need open areas where they can strut, where the hens can bug. Um, they need food sources. Um, and so they, they, a lot of times you'll, we, ha, well, we have so many plantation pines in the Southeast. There's loblolly pine trees everywhere. And so what you end up with are these very defined habitat changes. You'll be walking through these rows of planted pine trees and all of a sudden, boom, you're in the biggest, beautiful hardwood bottom that you've ever seen in your life. And what that does is those, those hardwood bottoms are a lot more, typically a lot more favorable turkey habitat than the pine trees are. Um, unless in some cases you have the pine trees that are managed correctly, but but still you'll find turkeys keying in on that change. And so what this does for me is a couple things. Again, it, it starts in a way, it highlights some of my creeks and drainage systems because often where you find creeks and where you find drainages, you also find hardwood trees. And then in between there and then is where we find our uh, coniferous trees, or our mixed trees, but I can key in on these different edges and I can key in on these creek systems. And so here's a point why like I know for a fact this works is this particular property that I'm on right now. I've I've hunted here in the past and I we came in here we were studying it for, leading up to the first spring. Um we saw this big creek system that was flowing out of this lake and then we noticed that there was you know pretty well defined edge on both sides with this creek running through the middle of it and we were like going off of what we know about habitat, there's a very strong chance that there's going to be a turkey roost along that creek somewhere. And sure enough, there was turkeys that roosted probably, if I remember correctly, it was right around in here. Um, and then we ended up killing them right around this edge. And, and so what you learn is, and this is another tip, um, talking about e-scouting and, and looking at habitat and what to key in on to find turkeys. Uh, this is this would probably be like if I was going to give everyone that's that's watching this like a big takeaway, like something to to go back with. This would be the one like, I guess the one take home tip. If you're struggling with e scouting, or you're trying to get better at e scouting. If you have um, history with places in the past that you've turkey hunted and you know spots where turkeys already are. You don't really you don't necessarily need to scout a map in these areas because you know there's turkeys there already. Like for instance, this this spot that I'm on right now, I know turkeys hang out right there. However, what I can do is I can go through, I can pull up places on the map that I've hunted before and found turkeys and I can start studying what's there. I can turn these different layers on and I can start looking at, okay, there was a turkey right here, but why? Well, I've got you know, I've got these hardwood trees right there. I've got some um, acorn producing oaks in there. There's this creek system right there. I can see down here to the south, there's an open area. I can see all these different habitat types kind of coming together in this one little bitty spot. And what I've learned is if you start, if you start pulling up areas that you know turkeys already like to be, and you start studying the maps in those areas, it starts clicking in your head. You start going, okay, all these areas where I've found turkeys in the past, they have some very similar habitat features. And so that'll help you 
if you're going into a new spot, you can start looking for those same things. Because more often than not, uh, where I find turkeys is either what it's I'm looking for two key things or, or one of two key things happen. It's either one, these these main habitat types that we look for are coming to gear, coming together in one spot or it's where the most limiting factor is. Like if I'm if I'm hunting a, a big piece of public and it's all just mainly monotonous, big hardwood timber um, with not a lot of change to it. If I find one field, like, and it might be a private field that I can't hunt, but more often than not, there's turkeys hanging out nearby. it, And that, so that's what I mean by, by like the limiting factor sort of thing. Um, another example, that I can pull from. Jack, I can't see the question bars. I'm doing this. So if I need to stop, just stop me. Yep. Till then, I'll just keep going. <laughs> um, there was a couple questions people asked about the accuracy of the tree species layers. Yeah. So those are each one of those little pixels, one of those little squares is 30 meters by 30 meters. And what we're showing there is the dominant tree species in that. 30 by 30 meter square. So if it says it's coniferous, it doesn't mean it's just coniferous trees. There may be some hardwoods in there, some deciduous trees. It means that's the primary one in there. And that data is collected by an aerial spectrometry, which I had to practice a lot to say that word correctly. It did. Um, but basically they're, you know, they do flyovers and they're able to tell, um, I don't know if it's specific cameras they use or what they use exactly but it's the color signature that bounces back to the plane that lets them know what the dominant tree species there is i don't know about you lake i found it to be pretty darn accurate in the year or yeah. two years that we've had it for sure and like i'm i'm not kind of like what you alluded to jack i'm not going to tell you that if you go stand in one of those red squares there's going to be a white oak tree right there but i've found it to be extremely accurate I probably there's going to be one close you know what I mean like there's gonna and so the reason again um when this when we first came out with this layer one of the ways that I tested it because again this this property that I've moved to now this is another area that I've hunted in the past uh consistently found turkeys had some really good hunts in here uh and I will heck I'll just move forward with the story and you'll kind of see what I mean like right now the only uh trees crops and cover layer that I have on right now is the the acorn producing oaks and out of the years that we've hunted this property so so very often we would find a turkey roosted right there and it makes all the sense in the world because if you again if we like let's pop a waypoint right there we'll call it a we'll just go with a strut and gobbler for time's sake but it's a roost tree um if we take, if I mean, if we just kind of look at this from like a, a big picture perspective, and we start like you, you look at this and kind of a kind of a, a ask yourself like, why is that turkey there? Um, that you'll find in pretty much all aspects of wildlife, but turkey especially, there's a rhyme and a reason to everything that they do, and so you can let turkeys teach you what kind of habitat that they want. And so we would always find turkeys right here. Well, we have our hybrid maps on. And so he's roosted, and this is pretty gentle topography in this area. You can tell because, again, the lines aren't stacked very tightly together, but there's some topography there. He's roosted right off the edge of a knob. There's a drain system, drainage system coming through right here. We've got our acorn-producing oaks layer on, and so there's oak trees right there. There's red oaks right there. And then not very far from that at all, there's open areas. Um, and again, if we, go, if we take it a step further... I know I'm toggling, toggling on in these off a lot, but I'm trying to show y'all how how where how well this works. Um, that's the deciduous versus coniferous. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, so like we can see the habitat diversity in this one. Small, this is not a large like a like a large area that I'm looking at right here. Like the the distance between um, this area right here from see from the roost point to uh, get out of that. Three hundred yards from the nearest open area. I mean, so we're we're talking about 
like that's what I keep brought up last time is you have all this habitat diversity in this one spot. And it's the kind of habitat diversity that turkeys like and need to thrive on. Um, and so that's, again, I, I would go to, if, you, if you're one of the best ways, hands down, to get more used to and better tuned in at, at finding better places to scout is study the maps and places that you know turkeys already like to be in. And you're going you're gonna to get a lot better at picking out spots. Like you can, if you, I mean, they just pull away, you know, go away with what you saw here. And when you go to a new spot or you're scouting out a new spot, look for some of those same features. Um, that's going to take me to my next point, And that is like ways to, I guess, expedite or better organize your e-scouting. Um, and here's what I mean by that. Let me find some random piece of public or something. We'll go... Let's go up here. And then there's a lot of acorn producing oaks on this place. So I'm going to turn that off so it doesn't distract us. Am I missing any looming questions, Jack, or am I good? No, nope, I'm just trying to answer as many as I can in the chat here. You're doing the Lord's work and I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I did see someone, this is a simple one to add, answer. Um, I saw someone ask, how do you turn the green off on, on public land? That's easy. So um, quick fix, hunt map layers, go down to the state that you're in. In this case, we're in Mississippi. Uh, private lands turned off, government lands turned off. And I, I, there is, um, I understand why you would ask that in some instances, if I'm really trying to study an area on public ground, sometimes I'll turn it off just so I can get the shade of green off there and really, like, really take a look at it. Um, and so I, I, I definitely understand that. But um, for instance, going talking about e-scouting if i one thing that i can't talk about enough is getting organized with your waypoints mm -hmm. the worst thing that you can do i mean not the worst thing but it's definitely not not good is like so if i want to drop you know i'm looking at right here for example i can see some some topographic changes kind of dumping off into a bottom right there i got all these drainage systems flowing in right here if i, I bet if i turned on the acorn producing oaks layer they would be all down these creeks and then there's these, all these open areas right here. Again, habitat change, all this habitat diversity in this one single spot. So if I've never been here before, this is somewhere that I want to go check out. So let's drop a waypoint right here is somewhere I potentially want to be and add waypoint. Now, if I add a waypoint, it's automatically going to, it's going to default, give me that red X. Um, which is fine if you want to keep it that. However, if you're someone that e-scouts a lot and, and drops a lot of waypoints, then you'll learn that there is a high, high value in customizing your waypoints. It takes a little bit more time, but the amount of time that it saves you cannot be, cannot be mentioned enough. So like I, I have my own personal coding system, but you can do yours any way that you want to. For instance, uh, if I... Like I usually, I try to do colors by year. So like 20, this 2023 turkey season, every new waypoint I drop has been blue. And then if it's an area that I know I want to go listen, then some of y'all are probably going to laugh at this, but I use the, where is it? There it is. I put a rabbit waypoint because rabbits have big ears. And that means I want to listen there. <laughs> you like that, didn't you, Jack? <laughs> I do. But it's it's nice, man, because like I'll and that's for when like I'll use red X's if it's like if I'm planning an out of state trip and I'm trying to like just peg a bunch of different WMAs or pieces or national forest, I'll just drop random X's on that. But if my the way my map is now, if I see just the default red X, that means I'm not very honed in on that point. That means like I'm just kind of dropping it on a general area. This blue rabbit, on the other hand, that means I want to go listen. I want to go put my ears on right there. Um, and that that carries further as well, because um, talk about the importance of historical waypoints. And, and here's what I mean by that. And moving all over this map, but that's all right. Um, Let's go back to this property up here where I was showing the, the habitat types and changes where we had the turkey roosted over here, 
Uh, and I do this all the time. Like if I'm, if I'm hunting in here and I hear a turkey gobble over here, uh, I'm going to mark him. Like I'm going to mark a waypoint. I'm going to drop a waypoint on him bar none. And like I said, if it's 2023, I'm going to make it blue, make it a turkey. Uh, if I'm feeling, if I'm feeling like really organized that day, I'll even do something like turkey gobble uh, three times. I mean, like it depends on how, how detailed I'm feeling, but I mean, it pays off and, and here's what I mean. So like, say I'm here the year 2024 next spring and I'm not hearing anything. And then I'll start rifling through some historical waypoints. I'm like, well, you know, we did get in a Turkey. We did get on a Turkey right there one time. And it, it'll, it'll, I, and I've had success doing that, like going to spots. I'm like, Hey, I'm not hearing anything right here. But if you remember, we got on a Turkey right here and we go, you know, within close proximity to that waypoint, we call, you know, he doesn't gobble every time, but it has definitely worked for me in the past. And so I'm very big on dropping a lot of waypoints, but I'm also very big on customizing those waypoints because if these just end up being a bunch of red X's, I don't really know what I'm looking at. I have to think about it a little bit more and I'm not, not too much on thinking. Um, it can get very confusing. And so again, it, it takes a little bit more time, but customize your waypoints it'll pay off uh mega dividends Let's yeah see. that's that's something i kind of tell people is you're never going to regret putting too much detail in there but you're going to regret not putting enough i did an audit of my waypoints a while back where i had a whole bunch that i just dropped mostly when i was hunting i hit that mark my location button and mm -hmm. then didn't put anything in there it's like well did I hear a gobble? Did I see a bird? Is that where I parked the truck? What What is it? Just deleted them because it means nothing to me a year removed, two years removed. Yeah. I write in there, you know, heard a gobble April 21st, you know, saw three jakes, mm -hmm. um, whatever. And then, like you said, I have my own color kind of coordination system and all that. So yeah. that this year when I go back, I can be like, oh, that's right. There was that group of jakes there on April 30th, whatever. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it, it, and I'm speaking like I'm, I'm the kind of person that learns things the hard way. So like if, if I were to pull up my map right now and like all of it, you would be like, I thought you said you customized your waypoints. But like I didn't start that until like a couple years ago. Like if I open my map now, I still have like so many just red X's. And I get some of them like the one a lot of them I deleted most of the ones that I kept, I can look at them and it might take me a while to think about it. I'll be like, oh, okay, that I remember what happened there. But like now, like if I drop a waypoint, it's going to be detailed. It's going to be customized. I'm going to know what I'm looking at when I pull it up. And again, takes a little bit more time on, on the front side of it, but it is paid off so much, like so, so much going forward. I can't, like I, I, that's a big take home as well. Like customize your waypoints. You absolutely will not regret it. Um, let's see, do we, we're doing good on Q and a. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I got a few for our Q and a, uh, time at the end, but. Okay, cool. We'll move to, um, planning, planning hunts on in a new state or a new spot, whatever, what have you. Um, so the bit one of the bigger things again and i'm always talking about mistakes that i see people make but like if you like again i've i've honestly i thought this was pretty harmless to do because i've never i've never personally hunted in the state of indiana and so hypothetically if i was planning a hunt there i've seen folks where they're like ah i have my government lands lair turned on i can see that this is a very large national forest and uh they drop a waypoint on it and they may even go as far as scouting it out. Like we talked about turning on the tree species layers, turning on, you know, dropping specific waypoints, listening waypoints, potential roof site waypoints, so on and so forth. However, they leave that, you know, they pack up the truck, they leave, they drive however many hours, they pull up to the state forest and they find that there are other hunters everywhere. Or for whatever reason, they're just not hearing a lot of turkeys. Maybe, you know, maybe it's late in the season. They've been hunted a lot and that's a popular spot. Who knows? But my point is, is they put all their eggs into the basket of this one spot. And when they get there and it immediately doesn't pan out, then you're 
thrown into panic mode because you're like, I've got, you know, sometimes folks get, hey, you know, folks have a, you know, regular job and they may have Friday afternoon, Saturday and Sunday to hunt and they're done. And so what you can do, and again, these are all red X's because I didn't put a lot of stock into them. These aren't like specific locations, but I will go through and mark every single particular piece of public that I think I can possibly hunt. And I'll even go as far as like looking at the road systems and seeing, uh, I'm going to turn hybrid map off for a little bit, just because it's getting a little busy on there. But like, I'll mark the national forest and then I'll start looking at the surrounding private land because I can't tell you how many times I've had success, especially if it, if it, if I scout it out and it looks like a good Turkey area and the Turkey habitat looks good. I've had so much success getting permission on these places. Uh, and there, there's obviously there's several ways you can get permission. Um, the, the one thing that I would say always consistent, however you go about doing it is be respectful if you go about getting permission, but there's been several times where I'm on an out-of-state turkey hunting trip and on near a national forest or a WMA that I've been hunting, I see a turkey strutting in a field or I just drive by a place and I go, man, that looks like some good turkey habitat. And if I see a house there and it looks like somebody lives there, I'm going to go knock on their door and say, hey, sir or ma'am, how are you doing? My name is Lake Pickle. I'm up here turkey hunting from Mississippi, so on and so forth. But yeah, I'll, I'll even go as far as just looking around the private land and seeing what it looks like. And 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 uh, it's another one of those things that like scouting wise takes a little bit more time, but it's paid off dividends. I think, Jack, you and I were talking about this earlier, getting ready for this. Uh, when it comes to the, the thing, one of the things that is most significantly important in spring turkey hunting is scouting. One of the things that is most commonly overlooked or not done enough is scouting. So you, you you've got to put your time in on the forefront. I can't I cannot say that enough. Yeah, I mean, the only reason I've killed turkeys the last couple of years is because I put miles and miles on my truck in the spring driving around. And obviously I'm in western Montana. It's a little bit different game than where you are in Mississippi or in Indiana. Um, the Miriam's birds a little bit different, but the principle is the same. I'm not a great caller. I'm not great at decoys or the setup or anything. What I can control personally myself is I can scout a lot. So I can find areas where, you know, other people aren't hunting or just to have, all right, I've got three or four roost locations so that, like you said, with an out of state, if you can get there early and scout a lot and have have some some options, like you said, you get there in the morning and oh, there's a truck there, or there's a bunch of people there. All right, we're on to the next spot. Versus, I've done that in the past before I was killing turkeys. Was like, all right, I got a spot. Get there in the morning and somebody had camped out the night before and was waiting there already. And it's like, you know, I'm not gonna be that guy and blow up their hunt. It's all public land. It wouldn't be. Right anything illegal but you don't want to be that person of course because I wouldn't want it to happen to me but to have have a bunch of different options and then you know sometimes there's obvious places where turkeys are and people know about them and sometimes you can find that little hidden gem maybe it's there's a lot of public land there maybe you find that little piece that's 20 acres that people are like oh man maybe that's not even I don't even know if I want to hunt it um, that's kind of a thing last year where people be like ah it's only 40 acres is it worth hunting it for turkeys yeah. you're darn right it is yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. um and and some of those overlooked spots yeah for sure man I, I mean like i'll i've gotten to the point now like i don't think the way i scout now compared to the way i scouted six seven years ago it's night and day just because mm -hmm. like i would i would kind of you know just pan around a little bit like ah you know it looks like turkeys in there and the other thing too man it's like even if I have like it, let's say that I've scouted this place. Like, and again, I don't, I don't want anyone getting mad at me. I, I can't express enough. I've never been to this place in my life. I don't know if there's turkeys here or not. It looks pretty good. Um, but let's say I've scouted this area out to the nines. Like I've got listening locations picked out. I've got habitat features that I like. Like I, I, I know spots that I absolutely want to go check out. The first day that I get there. I'm probably spending 
the vast majority, if not all of that day, putting in windshield time and just boots on the ground, listening, looking around, see it, just familiarizing myself. Because again, like if I go, you know, if I put all my eggs in the first goblin turkey I hear and it doesn't work out and I have limited time, you know, then, then I still like, all I know is that one area. So I, I, I put a lot of emphasis on familiarizing myself and just seeing what's all out there. How many turkeys can I put my ears on? Um, how, you know, again, cruising around the private land and like seeing potentially where can I door knock, you know, where can I try to get permission? Um, it, it, there's there's a lot of emphasis that gets put on scouting and the reason that I do that the reason that my scouting routine has changed so much in six and seven years is I've found that the the more increase that I the more emphasis I'm put on scouting it directly correlates with how much success I have um it, it, it's it's night and day so scout 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 and then scout some more <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to make sure I haven't missed anything before we go to Q and a, no, I think we're good. I think we can start answering questions. Here's one I saw, um, come through the Q and a. So after using all these tips for determining where they possibly could be, let's say this is not a travel situation. This is a place where you're, you know, hunting around home. Mm -hmm. How far ahead of the season should you start scouting? And do turkeys change their location based on the season or or the change of the seasons? So, okay, last question first. Do they change their locations based on the season? Yes. There's there's fall and winter patterns. There's fall flocks. You know, I mean, we don't have – down here in the southeast, we don't have the big winter flocks that you'll see in, like, Wisconsin or, or areas like that. But you'll definitely have um, – flocked up turkeys the areas where they like to hang out changes um depending on on habitat type the areas where they hang out changes during the spring man especially if um one of the things one of the habitat features that they absolutely need or the hens absolutely need is nesting cover and so um a a common a common instance or i shouldn't say common but definitely it's not rare uh so a thing that we see that I've seen down here before is you'll see a tra- like a property that's like big, like the whole thing's big open hardwoods. You don't have a lot of, you know, big, cha- a lot of diversity in one spot. And still during like on the creek bottoms, you'll have turkeys there in the early season, but because it's all big um, open hardwoods, there's not any nesting cover. And so later on in the season when the hens start nesting, they leave because they've got to go nest somewhere. And so I've had folks that they're like, man, we had turkeys here early and then mid to late season, they just disappeared and we didn't kill them all. I'm like, man, they moved. Um, And so uh, when it comes to scouting, I don't think you can do enough of it. I mean, you're not going to do yourself too many favors scouting in the summer other than sweating. I mean, you definitely can (laughs) familiarize yourself with the, with the territory, but I mean, Man, like, so season here in Mississippi opens on March the 15th. If I, like, let's say there's some WMA draw hunts that I always like to try to get in on. Obviously, like this year, I put in for like nine WMAs hoping to draw one. I drew none. Um, But like, let's say I drew one of those WMAs. I'm going to go, I'm going to start e-scouting that thing immediately. If I get permission to hunt a new place and they say I can I can hunt the entire turkey season if it's February the 1st and I can get out there and look around I'm going to get out there and get looking around I'm not necessarily thinking about hearing a turkey gobble or seeing a turkey strut but I'm going to start looking for what the habitat looks like because again if I have started familiarizing myself with what turkey's like I can get out there and start you know kind of putting together like yeah this definitely looks like a good area I you know I'm going to come listen in here um, I'm going to start looking for tracks. I, I would get boots on the ground as, as soon as possible. Yeah, I I agree for the most part. A um, little bit different game out west here. A lot of a lot of our game is kind of playing the snow line a little bit as the snow melts. Right now, you know, I'm in Missoula, Montana. Turkeys aren't native here. The reason we have turkeys and they survive is largely because of agriculture. So that's where they're hanging out right now as you know and i'm scouting a little bit right now it's going to be our season opens may or uh, may april 15th so it's going to be a couple weeks before i get serious about it um but i'm 
driving around all the time. I got a little bird dog right now. I'm just driving around doing some training on public land. I'm always kind of keeping my eye out for where I'm seeing turkeys, knowing that in a month, they're probably going to be in that same area, but maybe higher up the mountain as the snow melts. They can kind of follow that line a little bit. Mm -hmm. Obviously, sometimes they just stick on the private down in that good feed. Um, and that's a little bit of a challenge here. But yeah, like you said, if you got the gas money and you got the time, you can't really scout too early. Um, it's not going to hurt you. Um, if you're like, man, I, I have limited time, you know, maybe you got to start closer to the season, but uh, I don't really know where I was going with that. But <laughs> the more you can scout, the better. And yeah. they definitely do move as the season goes on. Like Lake said, as the hens are nesting, that's going to change things up as, you know, things start greening up, as insects start hatching, food sources might start changing. Um, they can definitely shift around to different areas. Yeah. And, and that comes with like, man, especially if you know, I spent a lot of time of, of talking about, you know, if you're hunting a new place, um, if you're down here, unless you travel, what you end up with is you end up hunting a lot of the same places over the years, even on public land. I mean, there's, there, I, I hunt pieces of public ground here that I've been hunting since I was like 12 years old. And what you learn is you start, the longer that you hunt there, you start putting together, you know, like, uh, you know, when those turkeys move or in that I, I got buddies that own properties that they, you know, either it's a lease or it's a property that they own. And they'll tell you, they're like, man, I really don't, I really don't have any, you know, there's no sense in hunting that place till about mid April because they know the turkeys just, they don't, they're not there until mid April. And that, that's just things that you learn um, by just gaining history um, on a place. Where are we at? Q and A's. I want to. Is there any get asked live that we definitely need to hit on, Jack? I, I, can, like... I was just at our uh, pre-registration questions, but I can pull up some uh, other. There was one here I had marked. Um, so there was one somebody asked it specifically about Miriam's. We kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, Lake and I were talking a little bit earlier. Miriam's kind of have this uh, reputation as runners, you know, put your track shoes on. They yeah. move a lot. They seem to move more than say an Eastern or an Osceola does. I think some of that's got to be just the landscape they're in. They probably have to move a little farther from good roost cover to good feed cover to go get water. Um, the nice part with Miriam's generally, they have the reputation as being not as difficult to call in. Sure, everybody's got a story of a Miriam that, you know, was impossible to call in. Um, but I would say for Miriam's especially, you might have to put the miles on. I've known some guys where they'll say they've got a week to hunt. And let's say they're going to like the Black Hills or, or somewhere in Wyoming, Colorado, Eastern Montana, kind of those destination areas. And they'll say, if I got a week to hunt, I'm not afraid of spending a day or two scouting. And just driving, just hiking, and not even, you know, have a gun with you if the season's open, of course, but that's not the primary goal. You know, they'll sacrifice a day or two of hunting to get some scouting in just because they can occupy such a vast landscape. Um, you know, and then if they only have three days to hunt, they would rather do that versus sitting down under a tree and hoping there's a bird within within hearing distance. Man, here's here's my Merriam story because like the I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, any turkey can be easy on the right day, right? Like the any you can any turkey can be easy on the right day, but the the mindset that every Merriam ever is easy is false. Because um, to your point, Jack, like you said, they they Easter like Merriams are prone to cover a lot of ground, and they're also people think like, man, they just gobble all the time, or they see like urban birds that just appear and they think they're dumb you know, um, and they're like, man, they gobble all the time. They're easy. Like that's part of it goes back to what you're talking about, about them being in those open areas. Like they'd be in these wide open spaces and they gobble. To, I mean, it's a, again, I mean, it sounds obvious, but it's a, it's a communication tool. Like the, it's open areas with a lot of like undulating terrain and they gobble a lot to, to let each other know where they're at. Like, I can't tell you like one of the first times I sat down to a Merriam having not hunted them a lot 
And I, I figured it out after a couple of days of hunting him, but this turkey was pitching down out of this, out of these cottonwood trees along a Creek and he would hit the ground and he would immediately head West and he would not stop until he, re and so I spent all day chasing this turkey that I was never going to catch. And he was never going to turn around and come. He would gobble at me happy. He was happy to gobble at me, but he knew where he was going. And so again, it's like a, scouting would have paid off a lot for me in, in that situation but I was I was hot to try it and I ran in there trying to yelp him up and kill him and it, it didn't work until I pulled back and scouted and was like okay now I kind of understand what he's doing and then I was able to able to make it happen but um, again yeah. that's another testament to why scouting is important and I'll I'll tell anyone that like sure you can run into an easy Miriam but they're not all that way right we got a few minutes left here. I'm going to drop the giveaway link in the chat. So everybody that's still on with us, click that link. We're giving away some of our Onyx Turkey t-shirts. So go ahead and get entered there. Giveaway uh, is open till midnight tonight. So if anybody's watching this video on YouTube, you know, after March 21st, giveaway is not live anymore. Sorry about that. Um, but I'll be drawing those winners tomorrow morning. I'll send an email out to everybody that has won. Um, and we'll get your shirt sent out. So make sure you get entered there. Uh, there was one question I saw here I thought was a good. Um, we talk about nesting cover a lot, but what what are we looking for kind of specifically? What qualifies as good nesting cover? How do I know it when I see it? So nesting cover, so when a hen goes to a nest, like you got to think like hens are obviously a ground nesting bird. I know that sounds obvious, but I talked to somebody one time that that was, that that was missed by them. They did not realize they nested on the ground. They do. Um, so they're a ground nesting bird, but they are also, so like their first and foremost instinct is they want to put that nest somewhere where it is safe. They know they're very aware that there's a lot of things out there that want to destroy that nest. They want to eat those eggs. And so you're not looking for like, I'm trying to not keep it just in southeastern terms because I was about to say a deer thicket, like a pine thicket. Um, but I mean, you don't, you definitely don't want something too thick. Um, but you're looking for a more like a thicker area. You're looking for somewhere that's got cover, somewhere where they can um, put a like get a nest and be be relatively hidden. Um, one spot that I have that I've seen notated by a a, a well respected wild turkey biologist is uh, a hen nested in, it was an area that had been burned. Uh, it, it hadn't been burned that year, obviously, because it would all be pretty scorched. Um, but it had been burned, I want to say maybe two years prior. And so it had some growth coming back up, was fairly thick. And there was, an, there was a, a small tree that had fallen over and the hen nested under that old fallen down tree because it still had... Um, it still had some pine needles to it, still had relatively some good cover, and that was a good hiding spot for her. Um, and so yeah, nesting nesting spots, you're looking for some just something more thick, somewhere where they can hide, so to speak. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. Yeah, they definitely you're not gonna find them nesting in real open areas. They're gonna be a sitting duck for a great horned owl or a bobcat or something in there. One thing, I get, and I, just to take it into a further detail, um, is, and I've heard Mike Chamberlain say this, is if you, because like where to find the line between too thick and thick where they put a nest is um, lay flat on your stomach and look out across the ground, and that's how a poult perceives its world. And so if it's too thick, a hen won't nest in there because she knows the poults won't be able to, not only will they not be able to see, they won't be able to move. They won't be able to get out of there. And so it's like this, this happy medium where it's thick, but it's, it's enough shrubby undergrowth where the, those little poults, I mean, I mean, they're like, you know, that big when they're born can, can walk around, you know, they can, they can maneuver. So say I'm, I'm, I'm no turkey biologist, but that's the best answer I can give to that question. <laughs> It's, well, I think we we pretty well covered most of the main points. Anything else you wanted to touch on? I lost did I freeze you. Up or did, you, did I freeze up or did you freeze up? I'm not sure. 
Um, it's it may be our our Wi-Fi at the office here has been spotty, so we maybe should end this sucker before I drop off completely. Gotcha. One, this is an easy one. So I, one person asked about sending waypoints. Um, again, you absolutely can do that. Uh, it's as simple as clicking on it and then clicking the option to share it. Uh, so that's that's a pretty cool feature. Again, for questions like that, and that's a perfectly fine question, but all I would do is I would direct you to those app 101s that we talked about earlier, April the 5th. Um, and I know that the next one's coming up April the 5th, Jack, but y'all do those fairly, y'all do those regularly. Yep. We try to do them every month. We didn't do one in March just because we had such a full schedule, but we try to do them every month, usually towards the first half of the month. So April 5th is the next one. I'm going to get the May one scheduled here, hopefully within the next week or so. Um, but we do those every month and all of our old ones, all of our old master classes in general, not just the one on ones, but all of them are on our YouTube channel. So if anybody wants to go back this spring, you mentioned Dr. Mike Chamberlain. We did a a master class with him earlier. We did one with the hunting public. We did one with Toxie and Cuz from Mossy Oak. So there's a there's a pretty good back catalog, even from last spring. We've been doing these over a year. So check out our YouTube channel for both the 101s and kind of all of our other master classes. That's a good resource too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, man, I thank I mean we a lot of y'all stayed on for the entire class and I, I appreciate it. I hope we we added some value to it. Um I think we're good, Jack. I mean, if you're if you're good, I'm good. I honestly I learned a lot just listening to you here. So, <laughs> so I got about three weeks until uh, a little over three weeks until season kicks off for me. So I'm getting ready to go pattern my gun one of these weekends and I'm jonesing to go. Stay the course, man. There's nothing yeah. like a spring turkey. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Um, I guess for Lake and myself, thanks for joining us. Make sure you enter that giveaway and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you all.